Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good morning, church. Elisa, Danielle, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Elisa, will you pray for God's blessings on this morning's day? Yes, absolutely. Dear Father in Heaven, I thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to study your Word and open it to you on this Sabbath day. We ask you to please send your Holy Spirit to guide us as we, we open the Word and, and we discuss. Touch our hearts, Lord, on those things that you have for each of us that we may hear we may apply, and through your power, we may be changed through these words. What an important message this is for us, Lord, and for the world. And so we, we don't want to miss it. So we thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This quarter, we are going to focus on studying the three cosmic messages. We're talking about the three angels' messages. This week's uh, Sabbath School lesson is entitled the everlasting gospel and you find that description on in revelation chapter 14 verses 6 and that's really the key text for to this week's study which says then i saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation to every tribe to every tongue and people. Here's a little brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson as an introduction to the lesson. In this week's Bible study lesson, we begin a detailed study of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. Throughout Scripture, God has always provided an appropriate and relevant message for the people, for his people. In Noah's time, God provided through Noah a message relevant for the people of his day. This was a message that in its entirety would have not fit any other generation in history. We're talking about a flood. During Babylonian exile, Jeremiah preached that his people should submit to the yoke of Babylon without resistance and should change their ways in relation to God and God's law. This was a specific message for Israel in exile. John the Baptist preached repentance in view of the soon coming Messiah. His whole message would only apply to one specific time in history. God has always sought to prepare His people for crisis or significant new events by providing special messages. These have always contained a general applicable truth or truths and specific admonition and appeals fitting the relevant time and occasion. The same is true in the days preceding the second advent of our Savior, the days just before the second coming of Jesus. When the great commission to give the gospel to all the world has been carried out, Christ will come. Complete Bible truth is to be preached, but God also has a special warning and an appeal in the final messages of the three angels found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to, 6 to 12. Throughout Scripture, Angels are portrayed as messengers of God. In the book of Revelation, angels flying in midair represent a heavenly message of divine origin, swiftly carried to the ends of the earth. It's a global message. These messages, of course, are to be proclaimed by God's last day people. Just before the coming of Jesus, the message of the everlasting gospel in the context of the judgment will be quickly preached throughout the world. One of the focal points of this week's study is the discover and understanding the depths of the gospel message. 
And so we will be addressing what is the gospel, why is it called everlasting, why must every human being on planet earth be given the opportunity to respond to the gospel, and why does the salvation of each person living in the last days of this earth's history depend upon his or her response? This week's study will answer these questions and will provide an in-depth understanding of the expression, the everlasting gospel. A second feature of this week's study is to help us improve and cement our understanding of Christ's mission to His last day churches. As we read in Revelation 14.6, the angel flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel proclaims this end time truth to every nation, to every tribe, to every tongue and people. There is a largeness to Christ's message proclaiming uh, are proclaimed by the three angels. In the first place, the message calls us to give our best for the kingdom of God. And then the message invites us to cooperate and work with Christ in His final appeal to human beings. This message is an appeal to each one of us to place priority on God's mission of redeeming lost human or humanity because that is where God's priority is. Danielle, why should we look at the message of Revelation as a message filled with grace and hope? So, Sunday's lesson is entitled, A Grace-Filled Book of Hope. But I don't know about you, but as you, I've talked to people over the years about Revelation, and I ask them questions about what they think of Revelation. The things that come out are, of course, the beast. Armageddon is big. I even remember when we were in Rome in the series, and the speaker, what, our speaker was interviewed on television, and the audience basically said, Book of Revelation, Armageddon. And there happened to be an Armageddon movie that had just come out at that time. Correct. <laughs> so, so that's what most people think about Revelation. But as we've been studying Revelation, uh, especially in this year, it's been a Revelation year, um, we could see from the very opening of the book of Revelation. So even before we get into our text from today, let's go back and look at Revelation 1, 1 to 3, and review it quickly because it's cementing in our mind what this book is about. So, Revelation 1, verses 1 to 3 says, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, not of the beast, not of Armageddon. It's about Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. So it's, the purpose of this book is to be shown to us, his servants, things which must shortly take place. It's a preparation book. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So he sent it in signals to his servant John, the revelator, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he bore witness to about Jesus Christ and his testimony to all the things he saw. And the clencher is, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So it's a time of the end book for us. It is for us to keep. It is for our blessing, blessing in different forms of protection and, and future with the Lord. And Revelation continues actually in verses 4 and 6. Revelation 1 continues and says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So we can see this was a message to the seven churches, but it's a message to the churches. We are a church. We are his church of today. Grace to you and peace from him. That's really what he's sending in this book, peace and grace. Who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the one that was first resurrected, were to follow him and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we can see, as just a brief reminder 
of why this is a graceful book, book because it is for our knowledge to know and to be prepared in the end of time so that we could be secure and feel blessed despite the things that are happening around us. As long as we know and we can see beyond the things that are enveloping our world, we will be fine. So let's go to Revelation chapter 14 where we are uh, focusing on today. So in J Revelation chapter 14, our text for today is verse 6, but I would like to read a little before that, starting with verse 1. Uh, so 1 through 6 will go. Then I looked, and behold, a land standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. So we can see it's a scene in heaven. It is around the throne and the lamp. Christ is there. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harp. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the, 40, the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women. And as we've studied before, it's like with um, women are did not defile with women means that they have kept their doctrines pure. They have not been corrupted. For they are virgins in the spiritual sense. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So these are the people in heaven. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruit to God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So in a way we're seeing the scene of what's going to follow. But then the scene changes and the three angels' message begins, which is a message for us on the earth. In order to be part of that group in heaven, this message is coming out to prepare us and to prepare the way. So here we begin the important part of our lesson today. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and, the worship, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and spring of water. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time unfolding this text because they will. So I, I can't steal their thunder. But what I like to, to point out is that we can see very clearly, first from the opening of Revelation, but also from the opening of chapter 14, that the future that the believers have is a bright one with the Lord in heaven with the Lamb. But there is an end time that is about to come, and there is a message for the world. We are particularly entrusted with this message as believers. And in, in a way, God presses his identifiable stamp of approval on his people to distinguish the genuine from the counterfeit. That's really what he's doing. And in the days of ancient Israel, when the heathen nations around them were polytheists um, and they worshiped multiple gods, Israel was one of those gods that honored the true God. And they had a powerful statement of, of faith that they had pulled from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Also, as they know, they called it the Shema. And twice a day, the, the Jewish believers would chant the Shema. And it, you know, this text is very interesting. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. We're going to jump to that. The text is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that was one of the things that they, over the centuries, they, they always chanted. Uh, in their exiles, they chanted it. Uh, and it reminded them of their spiritual, spiritual vision and the path that unif unified them as a people. The, chanta, the chanting that they were doing of a Shema also strengthened the people's resolve uh, to resist the various attempts to force them to abandon their spiritual vision and path. And Deuteronomy 6.4 was one of the first verses that a Jewish child in ancient Israel was taught as soon as he or she learned how to speak. 
there is an amazing example of power and faith uh, that uh, identity point that took place immediately after the Second World War ended in 1945. And some of the leading rabbis visited children's, uh, you know, Christian orphanages that had taken in during the war and before the war, they have taken in um, children that were Jewish children and in mixed them with Christian children so that they would uh, be saved. But after the war, most of the priests and nuns who ran these orphanages were just unwilling to release the Jewish uh, children back into the custody of their families. So the priests and nuns often denied that they had any Jewish children in their residence. Um, but during one visit, a leading rabbi decided to return in the evening and asked if he could return when the children were going to sleep, and he was allowed. So as he came, the priests... You know, they agreed, and as he, was, he had returned, he entered the children's room, and as he walked through the aisles of the beds, he chanted Hebrew words of the Shabbat. One by one, children burst into tears and cried out, Mama. Many repeated the words of the Shema. The priests were caught completely by surprise. Uh, you know, the, they were unable, these kids were unable to erase the things that had been solidified in their hearts and in their minds. And in a way, for us as Adventists, this, the Shema of the Adventist is the three angels' message. So, so, you know, it's very interesting to, to, to look at that. Um, and I wanted to, to pull some logos. I had sent our group logos uh, that have been changed. You know, there's been some updates into logos, but for all I can remember, many churches still have these logos. It's the uh, there you go, the three angels' message. So it's like a lot of the Adventist churches still have the three angels' message in their logo because it's our chant of faith, our identifying uh, Shema, so to speak. So let's review really quickly for our ending. Uh, Revelation 14, 6 to 7 as the beginning. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now, do we see anything like this only in Revelation? There are actually many texts in the Bible, and I will only quote one because you guys will quote some more. So my text that I'm going to quote so you can see, it's uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 14 to 16. And we'll close with that, and then I'll turn it over. Later, he, we're talking about Jesus. Uh, so Jesus, this is after his ascension. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, after his resurrection, before his ascension. So he is just meeting them in the upper room. And you can imagine the demeanor they had. They're hiding they're dejected. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. They didn't believe Mary. They didn't believe the other ones. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So he basically gave them that assignment, and that assignment is repeated through us in the third angel's message. Thanks so much, Danielle. Uh, it is quite amazing. The three angels' message is really a grace-filled um, message of hope, and that's wonderful. But in that message, Elisa, there is an everlasting gospel. And so... The three angels' messages are the everlasting gospel. Explain that to us. Okay, yes. Um, as you said in Revelation 14, 6, it's proclaiming that it is the everlasting gospel that God's messengers are to preach the entire world. And that, that adjective is very important, and it's important for us to understand it. If we, if we fail to understand the depth of the gospel, we will really miss the entire point of the third angel's message. And we can never really fully understand God's judgment hour message 
or the fall of Babylon or the mark of the beast if we fail to understand the gospel. So let's, let's take a look at this. The Greek word here that's used in the Bible for the word everlasting is ionius, and it means without beginning and end. That which always has been and always will be. So you can think about it being eternal. This definition conveys that the good news of the gospel is an expression of God's character of love. Before Satan rebelled in heaven, God looked down the portals of time and he saw the thief that was on the cross. He saw that Christ would die for that man's sins and that the thief in his dying moments would accept Christ as his savior and would have faith in Christ's promise that he would be with Christ forever in paradise. Even though the thief still paid the temporal consequences of his criminal acts with his earthly life, he died knowing that he was forgiven and that his eternal salvation was assured in Christ that one day he soon he would be reunited with Christ in that perfect world that has no end. That thief had a front seat view of what his sin cost the Son of Man. And yet his sin was not so great that Christ could not forgive him. Through Christ, <clears throat> the Father's love encircled this man and assured him of forgiveness and complete reconciliation. That is the gospel everlasting. Let's read a few texts to see how the Bible presents the meaning of the everlasting gospel. <clears throat> Go with me to 1 Corinthians 14, 1-4. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul explains here that the gospel is the good news that Christ died and was buried for our sins, and was raised again to life as foretold in the scriptures. It is through Christ's victory over sin and death that we are saved. And then in Romans 3, 23 to 26, we read, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as appropriation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Paul makes it clear that all have sinned and are in need of a savior and that only Christ, because of his shed blood for us, is able to redeem us. Christ's blood is the atonement of our sins, and by his grace, he gives to all the opportunity to choose him through faith. Even though we are guilty and worthy of death because of our sins, God has given Christ as our substitute. Choosing to pass over and delay judgment until we come to a fuller understanding and we choose for ourselves whom we will serve. In Romans 5, 6 to 8, it reads, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Knowing we could do nothing to save ourselves, God poured out his love for us through the death of Christ. He did this for all of humanity while we were still the enemy of God and regardless of whether 
or not we choose to serve Christ. In summary, the everlasting gospel is incredibly good news because, first of all, we are justified freely by grace. Second of all, grace is a declaration of God's righteousness. And third, grace justifies those who by faith accept Jesus. And lastly, God's love was demonstrated for us while we were yet sinners. Christ's grace is unmerited, undeserved, and unearned. Jesus died the agonizing and humiliating and painful death on the cross. He experienced the fullness of God's wrath against sin. He did all this that we may be redeemed. Any wonder, then, that salvation must be by faith in Christ alone? What, what could we possibly add? God put this plan of salvation in place even before the world was created. 2 Timothy 1.9 tells us, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. The gospel begins in the heart of God. Before we reach out to him, he reaches out to us. Before we ever seek him, he seeks us. Before we make one move toward him, he draws us to himself through the power of his love. God in Christ takes the initiative in our salvation. What an amazing grace and mercy has shown us. Go ahead. Thank you, Elisa. Yeah. Thanks so much. And I'm so, so happy about that because indeed uh, the everlasting gospel, um, the three angels message, is a story of grace. And Tuesday's lesson is really a continuation of what uh, you've heard from Elisa. And so the three angels' messages are a story of grace, and I want you to embrace that principle. And why do we say that? Well, they are the story of the Savior's love, which is beyond measure. It's a story of Jesus who loves us so much that he would rather experience hell itself than have one of us lost. They are the story of boundless, unfathomable, incomprehensible, unending, infinite love, an agape love that you and I will probably struggle to even comprehend a little bit of it. Grace is not an afterthought. You've heard Elisa, Elisa said just that. God is never caught by surprise. He's not subject to the changing winds of humanity's choices. As we have already seen, God's plan to deliver us from the domain of sin was not some afterthought when sin reared its ugly head. God was not caught off guard by the awful drummer of sin. You see, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 8, the Apostle John speaks of the lamb, lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You are, or you, you see that the pain of the cross has been in the heart of God from the very beginning. This is why Christ could say, as we read in Matthew 25, 34, Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You see, God's original plan for this world, which was temporarily interrupted by sin, will eventually succeed. The Apostle Peter, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, tells us, verse 18, "...knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things..." like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Verse 19, But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 20, Christ indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. 
The plan of salvation, my friend, my brother, and my sister, took place and was discussed and put in place even before this world was created. These verses of Scripture make it clear that Christ as the perfect redeeming Lamb was not an emergency plan introduced to meet an unforeseen change of circumstances, but was indeed part of God's eternal purpose, God's eternal plan of salvation. You see, the phrase everlasting gospel in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6, speaks of the past, it speaks of the present, and it speaks of the future. When God created humans with the capacity to make moral choices, He anticipated that they would make errant choices, that they would go astray. See, because human beings were created with the capacity to choose, God knew that they also had the capacity to rebel against His loving nature. And the only way to avoid this reality would be to create robot beings controlled and manipulated by some divine cosmic plan. I'm just glad that God never did that. But you see, forced allegiance is contrary to God's very nature. Love requires choice and the freedom to choose. Once beings are given the power of choice, the possibility of making the wrong choices exists. Therefore, the plan of salvation was conceived, conceived in the mind of God before our first parents' rebellion in the Garden of Eden, before this world was made. Ellen G. White, in Desire of Ages, pages 22, provides this insightful statement. The plan of our redemption was not an afterthought. This was not a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation, and now she quotes Romans 16, 25, a revelation of the mystery which has been kept in silence through times eternal, says Ellen White. And she goes on to say, it was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundations of God's throne. What an incredible God we have. The phrase everlasting gospel speaks of a God who loves the, 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 the beings He created so much that even though He fully knew the consequences of their choices, He made provision for their eventual rebellion before it happened. The everlasting gospel is an eternal gospel. It's a story of God's grace to a generation starved for genuine, authentic love and longing for meaningful relationships. The gospel speaks of acceptance. It speaks of forgiveness, of belonging. It speaks of grace and life-changing power. The gospel speaks of a God of unconditional love who cares so deeply that He will go to any length to redeem us because He wants us with Him forever. Ellen G. White, in Manuscript 153, written in 1898, makes the following observation. Pay attention. It's profound. While in the very act of bearing our sins, of carrying our sorrows, Christ was mocked and then she goes on to say, it was there on the cross that mercy and truth met together and where righteousness and peace embraced each other. What an unconditional love for human beings. The eternal gospel speaks not only of the past and present, but it also is the basis of a future with hope. It speaks of living eternally with the one, the God, whose heart is aching to be with you and with me forever. Danielle, the proclamation of the everlasting gospel is for our entire world. Into all the world. Explain that to us. 
into all the world. So we saw that in the very text that we've been repeating since the beginning, every one of us each time a little bit, but it's, it's good for us to repeat because you'll see where we're pulling it out. So we're looking quickly at Revelation 14, 6 to 7 again, and it says that I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Okay, that's general, earth. But then, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That's, nothing is excluded. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and springs of water. So let's try to unpack this a little bit. Angels flying in the midst of heaven. God gives his earthly messengers, preachers, uh, and teachers the everlasting gospel, the responsibility to carry the final message to the world. Now, angel, the word angel means messenger. So it's a sort of a play on word. It is of great importance. That's why angels are entrusted to give it to us because it was no small feat. But then we are the messengers on the face of the earth. So, and the work of Revelation in chapter 14 is the commission that Jesus gave his disciples carrying the gospel to the world. And we know that when we read in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, Jesus' words, and he says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that's not the only one. There's more text than that in our lesson. Um, if we quickly look at Matthew 24, 14, in the same time period, Jesus' words again, he says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So we know what time period that's going to be. The end. Our time, the time period before the end. So it's very interesting, the proclaiming the message with a loud voice, as messengers, we're supposed to do it with a loud voice, that the message, of the, it's supposed to be done with urgency. Uh, and everyone must hear it. Everyone needs to make a decision about its content versus yes or no. Which way are we going to decide? And it's the message of salvation, which we know. Uh, we've discussed a little bit of what it is, and I'm not going to cover that since we already covered. But the message is to be taken to the entire world to prepare them for the second coming of Jesus. That's really yeah. the purpose and the plan. Amen. Every nation, every community, every language, every race will hear the message before Jesus' return. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world. Now, why are we entrusted and not angels entrusted for this message? Why is it that we are the ones? Because we are the ones that have experienced sin, being lost, and salvation. It how could we, we only are, we are qualified, angels are not qualified to present this message to the entire world. They have never sinned. The angels that are coming from heaven to give this message to us, to preach to the world, they have seen it from the outside. They've been on the outside looking in, but we are the ones that have felt the pain, the separation, the distress, um, the hopelessness, and all of that, and we know what the plan of salvation means. That's why we are the only ones truly qualified and capable to bring that message, just as Jesus had to come to this world and live our life in order to be able to save us, to take our place. He was the only one qualified to do that salvation, and we are the only ones qualified to really take that message to the entire world. The other thing that I really want to point out is how ennobling that purpose and that plan is. When God gives us this incredible, um, there's nothing more fulfilling or more rewarding than being part of a divine movement like this. Um, providentially raised up by God to accomplish a task far bigger, far larger than any human being could actually possibly accomplish by themselves. And the, the beauty of it is that 
we have seen these kind of examples throughout the Bible of people that were not qualified. Um, so we, if we can quickly look at Gideon's example, I mean, let's review. So Judges chapter 6, we're looking at Midian and where he is. He is hiding in a threshing floor, threshing wheat, I mean in a wine press, threshing wheat in a wine press so that the Midianites can see him. And why? Because Midianites were oppressing them. So Judges 6 in verse 1 says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so they disobeyed. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds, which are in the mountains. And they were hiding everywhere because they were so persecuted by their neighbors. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, and on and on and on. It describes the ravaging destruction they would do. And then we go on and jump down to verse 11. And here is Midian. I mean, here is uh, Gideon hiding in a wine press, threshing his wheat so that the Midianites can't find him and can't see him and can't persecute him. So he says, the, the, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree which was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty men of valor. And you go, okay, he's hiding. But we know the rest of the story. God, he trusted God. God equipped him. And he went down in history how he prevailed with only 300 men against the mighty army of the Midianites. So God called him. And he became something bigger than he was. He did something that he could never have accomplished by himself. And that so is with this message that is given to us as believers. Another example is Queen Esther. I mean, we know Queen Esther, she became Queen Esther, but she was fearful in her position because the previous queen had been deposed in a very mm, ruthless way, and she could be deposed in a similar manner where she couldn't even go into the king unless she was summoned. And all of a sudden, her people are being threatened. They're, being, they're going to be destroyed. They're going to be executed by kingly order. And she's one of them. But she's not daring to go to talk to the king. And her cousin Mordecai says in Esther chapter 4, 13 to 14. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows? whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And just as Queen Esther, we can say, who knows if God didn't bring us to this time period in our lives, like our lives happen in this time period for such a time as this. Amen. And we can quickly think of Abraham. He was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And it says in Genesis 12:1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So this is just three examples. God equips, calls first, equips, and gives success. And so he will do with this mission that is being given us. Thanks so much, Danielle, Lisa. Mm -hmm. We truly are talking about a mission. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a movement. Explain that to us. Yes, I will. And Daniel, I loved what you said about how personal it is and, and how this messenger that flies through the heavens, it's not just the angel, but we all have a role in that mm -hmm. if we are faithful to God. Amen. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about here today. And <clears throat> when you think about where we're at in history and, and the culture that we have today, and so many people... Of, of all ages, really, but especially in the younger generations, really struggle to find a purpose. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and to a devastating degree where it causes very severe depression and 
and consequences. Um, God has given us a purpose, Amen. and he has, he has made it very clear, and it, it's, it's a purpose that is fulfilling. Uh, so let's review that. The th so the, third, the three angels' message of Revelation 14 that we've been discussing. To take the everlasting gospel message to the whole world, to call all people to worship the one true creator God, to announce that the time of God's judgment has come, to proclaim that the apostate systems of the earth have fallen and under, are under God's judgment, and to call God's true followers out of those apostate systems, lest they too receive the wrath of God's judgment. Proclaiming this message is the mission of God's last day church. And it has been the mission and still is the mission and will be the mission of our church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. So through a <clears throat> perceptive deep study of the Bible, the early Adventists, had a growing understanding of the significance of these messages. They sensed that God had a special, special message for this generation. And as, as Victor had eloquently laid out when we started this discussion, at each period of time, there was a message relevant for that present time. And this message is relevant and most needed for, for our present time and for this generation. It's an urgent end-time message that must be proclaimed to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people in order to prepare the world for Christ's return. God does not want anyone to be lost. He wants everyone to hear of what Christ has done and the, and the opportunity they have to submit their life to him and be redeemed. So throughout our history as a church, we have sent missionaries into the farthest parts of the world, and in the past decades of media, we have and continue to proclaim the gospel through radio, television, the internet, and so forth. But Jesus also commissioned apostles to be a witness for him and preach the gospel throughout Judea and the whole world. The apostles and God's faithful people throughout history believed that it was their central purpose in life to proclaim this message. And with a fuller understanding of Revelation 14's messages <clears throat> for these last days, our church has been proclaiming this gospel around the world. However, it's not just the purpose of the church. It is a life purpose for each of us individually who believe in Jesus. So let's read a few texts of, of what the Bible says about this purpose. In Acts 1.8, we read, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And in Romans 1.1-5, we read, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received a grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. We've read in Revelation 14.6 that there is an important message for the angel, these messengers of the, of the church and those who believe in Christ to, to share in this last time. Daniel read in Revelation 1.1-3 about John's special purpose to receive the message of the revelation of Jesus Christ and through his word, write it down and then communicate that um, to the world. So the gospel of Christ is the most inclusive of all theologies, ideologies, and philosophies. Salvation through faith in Christ and a blessed life purpose of sharing the gospel is available to all humanity. It is the good news for a sin-sick world. 
to a generation who is starved for genuine, authentic love and longing for meaningful relationships, the gospel speaks of acceptance, forgiveness, belonging, grace, and life-changing power. It speaks of a God who has unconditional love, who cared so deeply for us he would go at any length to redeem us because he wants us to be with him forever. However, we can never be fully ready to share the gospel unless, we, unless we've experienced the gospel for ourselves. I, I don't know about you, but some of the most moving um, things that I, I hear are really the testimonies of others Amen. and how God has changed mm -hmm. so much in their life and what he's done for their life. And it brings the gospel to life. And so... That those messages, when when the gospel has touched your heart and you can share that with others, there's really nothing more compelling in, in, in my book. So the gospel starts in God's heart, and then it connects with the hearts of each of us individually. By experiencing the salvation of Christ for ourselves and enjoying that continual relationship with him, we are able and eager to share the gospel with others. So <clears throat> let me leave you with some final thoughts on this. Ellen White writes in The Steps to Christ, Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, sinful, helpless, dependent. We may come with all of our weaknesses, our folly, our sinfulness, and fall, out, fall at his feet in penitence. It is his glory to encircle us in the arms of his love and bind up our wounds to cleanse us from all impurity. So what more can each of us do to share these precious, life-changing, and life-saving truths with others? Thanks so much, Elisa. Really appreciate, and I really appreciate that quote as well. Do you have one last thought? I have a couple of thoughts. So the, my thought is this. God is speaking up to us and calling us like he did to Gideon, you mighty men of valor. Even if we are scared and afraid, just like, Midian, like, like Gideon was and hiding, he's calling us out to pick up his vision and he will equip us. And he's saying to us, just like he said to Queen Esther through Mordecai, for such a time as this, you may be born on this yeah. earth for such a time as this. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Danielle. Really, it's been a joy for us to be able to, to really share thoughts on, on this lesson. A great everlasting, everlasting preaching, everlasting message to the world. My final thoughts, and I want to express that to you. I want to begin by making a statement. Uh, and the statement is very real. Um, the Seventh-day Adventist church uh, looks at the three angels' message in Revelation 14 as our identifying statement of faith. It's an identifying statement of faith. Um, they define who we are as a people. They describe our mission to the world. And they are a source for the passion we have to proclaim the gospel to the entire world, the everlasting gospel. As shown to a dying thief at Calvary, and Elisa, you, you, you touched on that. The everlasting gospel is the good news that salvation is a gift of God. That thief on the cross, he received that gift. That, you know, to, to that dying thief on Calvary, the everlasting gospel um, tells him that God saves. God saves us. Not because we are good, but because God is good. That our salvation is not dependent upon our works, but it is dependent on God's grace. Your works and my works is never going to get us anywhere because we are just filthy rags. But it is God's works. That all our good works are motivated by love and empowered by grace. That's a good measuring stick. When my works are motivated by love and empowered by grace, then God is with me. 
Righteousness by faith. And I think you touched on that. Righteousness by faith. God's unending love, that immeasurable love, that agape love, and His abounding grace are not preambles to the three angels' message. That's not what they are. They are at the very heart of the three angels' message. That's what the message is all about. This is the message of the everlasting gospel. This is to rapidly go to the ends of the earth to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. Ellen G. White makes an appeal for you and for me tonight, for, me, for you and for me this morning. And the, the appeal is found in Testimonies for the Church, volume 9 and page 19. Testimonies for the Church, volume 9 and page 19. And here's the appeal. In a special sense, says Ellen G. White, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. She's saying that you and I are watchmen and light bearers. She goes on to say, To them, to you and to me, has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On us is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given, you and I have been given a work of the most solemn importance, she writes. The proclamation of the first, the second, and the third angel's message. And then she ends with these two sentences. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. No wonder in the Beatitudes, our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, understanding that we would embrace this commission, that we would embrace the challenge of preaching the gospel, he turns around to us and says, Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden when you reflect the light. And then, two verses later, Matthew 5, 16, Christ goes on to tell us, let your heart, your light so shine before man that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's a commission. And I really hope that you embrace the times we're on, that you embrace the message of the three angels, the, the, the three angels message, and you commit yourself to be a servant for God's kingdom, sharing the message, and living the message every day. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. Lord, you are a God of grace, a God of new beginnings. You are a God that, even before this world was made, knew that by providing perfect love, which provides choice and gives us the ability to choose whichever way we so desire, that you had an answer for going the wrong way, getting into the wrong road, choosing the wrong things. And Lord, on that cross, on that cross, O oh Lord, Righteousness and peace embraced each other. On that cross, O oh Lord, mercy and truth met. And as we embrace what you did on that cross for each one of us, we become an extension of you so that we may glorify you through the works that the Holy Spirit does in us for you. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your amazing love. 
We want to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And Father, we want to love each other as we love ourselves. Lord, in order for us to do that, help us take our will and mold it into yours so that it is not our will that drives the vehicle. And Lord, help us to die for self so that we can enjoy a life in you and you in us at that resurrection, your resurrection. Father, as we give ourselves unconditionally to you, we will continuously be a servant for you, reflecting your character, reflecting your truth, your love, and your light. Thank you for a message so relevant and for an, an opportunity for us to be co-workers with you. Give us a wonderful day. Bless us on, during this Sabbath. And Lord, every day hereafter until your coming. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.